Hi all, welcome to this Rowie Summer Showcase panel, The Joys of Print and Performance. I'm your host, Andy Davis, and our panel today consists of four University of Roehampton lecturers, Dr. Tim Atkins, Dr. Susan Greenberg, Dr. Jeff Hilson, Professor Peter Yeager. Um, quite excited to see, well, to hear what each of them will bring to the table for this. Um, I'm just gonna run down quickly how it's gonna work. Um, and so basically each panelist will speak on their response to the title of the panel, and then we'll have open discussion and finally close with a Q and A if there are any questions. Um, and I'll read um, brief bios before each of our panelists speaks. Um, and I believe it would be good if we started with Dr. Tim Atkins, if that's all right. That's fine with me. Can I share my screen, folks? I um, have a short thing to share with you. I'll make that full screen. Uh, there we go. Martin, and I'll um, just uh, read your bio. Go ahead. Fantastic. You're on your way. So Dr. Tim Atkins has been a member of the summer faculty at the Jack Curric School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University and a member of Carla Harriman's Poets Theatre in San Francisco. He is the author of many books, including Atkins, Collective Patriarch, a Times Literary Supplement and Salon.com Book of the Year from Creative Press, and a collaboration with his daughter, Yuki Lili Matsuyushi Atkins, A Girl is a Machine Made of Birds from Canary Wharf, Wolf Press. He is also the author of a play, a novel, and his poems have appeared in many anthologies, including the Penguin Book of the Prose Poem, the Reality Street Book of the Sonnet, and Faber's The Thunder Matters. His next book, Nothing Conclusive Has Yet Taken Place in the World, the <laughs> The ultimate word of the world and about the world has not yet been spoken. The world is open and free. Everything is still in the future and will always be. Is that from Creator Press in the autumn? And it the is. title is a marvelous short thing. A collaboration with American artist Rebecca D. Domenico comes from between. Is also out later in the year, and he's currently composing and writing an opera called Do One Daddyo. Over to you, Tim. Thank you. Um, the thing that's given me greatest pleasure is appearing in the reality. Street Book of the Solid, um, as it came up on the uh, on the thing. Um, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to just get going. Um, uh, performance, poetry, reading. This is a brief kind of just overview of, of what goes on in that, in my understanding of it. Um, we've got a picture of this. Jeff Elson looked a bit like this halfway through lockdown, um, but, it, but it, it's actually a um, bardic poet. And so the history and tradition of kind of reading aloud, feel free to tell me I'm completely wrong about all of this, folks, as we go through, of course. Um, the history of bardic reading aloud, uh, 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 someone with a lyre and a spear, um, something we'll all be familiar with, those of us who go to poetry readings regularly. Um, in the modern era, in the 20th century, um, in the early 20th century, performance and kind of more public viewings and listening to poetry um, took place in salons, literary salons, um, in uh, Paris, in the UK, lots of posh people who had big, who had nice drawing rooms and, and avant-garde wallpaper. Um, this is the kind of thing that kind of really went on in terms of, you know, not um, reading, basically. Um, Dylan Thomas in the modern era, um, that, that combination of cravat and uh, cardigan, a winning combination, I would say, um, became kind of particularly famous in the States for his um, drunken readings in uh, across the, the kind of pubs and bars and new campuses of the USA. And really in the 1950s, this is when a kind of more public type of um, reading and performance of poetry started. Uh, LP records, um, many of us will have had T.S. Eliot, Wallace Stevens records and cassettes of people reading their work. I don't know, Jeff, Peter, you may be talking about kind of the transference of the live voice onto the kind of recorded form and how that kind of changes things. Um, more records, um, people as they heard poetry being read, the idea of it as a kind of live living art form um, 
developed. Bill Bissett, one of my favorite poets, loved Edith Sitwell's records in the 50s. And then as you know, the LP record took off in the 60s, really big style people were making more kind of varied recordings of their own work. Most famous early launch in a way, sometimes held as being launch of live performance was the Gallery uh, 6 reading in San Francisco in the 1950s. Uh, poets you may be familiar with, uh, Allen Ginsberg, particularly the most famous poet there. Um, and with that, in a way, you can see, notice the similarity, folks, um, not accidental. I think Allen Ginsberg, look, reading to huge groups of people, this was kind of the area when, in the 60s, when poetry readings were really hugely popular at times. I'm sure they were, they were also very sparsely attended at others, of course. Um, the idea of poetry as a performed art, by the time we got into the early uh, 70s, you can see much more international, very diverse groups of people reading these are both from San Francisco. Um, lots of poets from Central South America, USA as well, were doing readings. Um, the last poets were arguably one of the first rap groups, pre-rap, proto-rap groups, and they're putting out their poetry accompanied by music on LPs. Um, Laurie Anderson, a movement, again, to a kind of more performed, written, poetic space, multimedia space, was working and operating, starting in New York in the mid-70s. Julie Patton is someone who's my age poet who's was taking a lot of language writing avant-garde writing ideas and um working in performance spaces mainly in the usa but also um which she was in the uk a couple of years ago giving some really fantastic performances nowadays where we've got to now um Dana smith many of you will be familiar with um poetry exists in performance really happily online if you, you know, it, it's everywhere these days. C.A. Conrad, another writer. Um, I'm happy as we've gone through this tradition, we've gone from uh, eccentric white people to a much more diverse group of um, writers who are available to the world now. And my final slide is just to say, look, here we go, Zoom. I think what's happened in the last 14 months, the idea that there are Zoom meetings of poets who are reading across time zones and appearing in people's rooms online, uh, puts us in a really, maybe the healthiest place that performed, read poetry and, and literature has ever been in. Uh, that is the point at which I shall end my little presentation. Thank you. Marvellous, thank you, Tim. Wonderful. Now, I think if we move on to, let's go to Susan, would you be ready? Sure, thanks very much. Okay, I'll just read out your, uh, do you need your screen shared or? Uh, no, actually I wasn't going to show anything. Marvellous, I'll just read out your bio. Dr. Susan Greenberg joined the creative writing team at Roehampton 16 years ago to teach classes in nonfiction writing. She is convener of the MA in Publishing and publisher of the School of Humanities in-house imprint, Finch and Press. Her last book, A Poetics of Editing, makes a case for a new field of editing studies and her work in publishing history considers the role of voice in historical method. Take it away, Susan. Thanks so much. Um, so when I was given this brief, I thought, well, performance, I'm talking about performance and editing. And um, uh, so coming at it from a different angle, uh, it, it's not literally performing, but, but, but it, uh, we're thinking about it more metaphorically. Um, and we sometimes think of performance as something artificial uh, not real, you know, if an actor on the stage isn't really the person that they're playing, but it's putting that aside, it's 
more to do with enacting speech. It's your your um, physically putting into motion words, <laughs> which which are communicated to other people, and you're using your body to do that. And we all enact speech every day of our lives. Uh, an act is an action. It's something we do. Speaking is an, a speech act. For speech, we use language, which communicates between ourselves and others. And so I'm just going to sort of throw a whole series of propositions, which um, I want to um, offer for discussion. I mean, you may or may not agree, but I mean, I think there's probably some overlap at least. So I'm just uh, saying, you know, so acting is a practice, writing is a practice, editing is a practice. Um, we're all, and they're all practices that use language. And um, when we do this practice, we are embodied. There's someone who is doing something and our bodies includes our minds. Our minds have to be in a body to work. They're not separate. And part of what we do what, is we think and our minds are creating pictures of different scenarios. That's the whole what if. So our imagination is our mind creating pictures um, what if this, what if that? And uh, if you want to get theoretical, you know, theory of mind in literary studies is saying that not only are the mind and body not separate, but mind and language are, are not separate. Language is an enacted social event. It's not just a thing. A word isn't just a thing. It's a dynamic autopoetic process. And the technologies that we use to reproduce language are also autopoetic processes, although at one remove. So most of the time we're not aware of all this, but if you are making a text, literally explicitly making a text, then it's conscious. And the editor, for example, looks at the text as if they are the reader, they are the embodied reader during the process, not afterwards. And then you get a book off the write something, it goes through some kind of editing process, it's made into a thing that can be shared, it has a shape, it has a form, decisions are made about the shape and form and how it reaches its readers. And with print, you've got the paper, the choice of paper, you've got the devices on the page like chapters, paragraphs, punctuation. And with digital books as well, you've got decisions about the platform or navigation uh, and, of course, design. You've got computer coding where you mark up a text so the computer can understand and the text will perform as intended. And um, so this is obvious when it's literally marked up text, but it's also these these codes are also present in natural language. We just take it for granted. And so just as the mind is not separate from the body and words are not separate from the mind, the text is not separate from the final physical thing. And we make decisions when we write, when we edit, and we make the thing that's shared with readers. And those decisions are always of fixing intention. But as we all know, when we work with words, the more you do that work, the more you appreciate how slippery language can be. And the text is, even in its final print form, uh, somehow there's always a sense in which it's unfixed. And that's why we talk about an edition of a text. It's at that particular moment in time, it, there's a snapshot of the text, which is fixed for now. And then there will be another edition or perhaps not. And I, I sometimes use the concept from developmental psychology. There's this concept of the good enough parent and I talk about the good enough text it's good enough for now we're sending it off and then we're drawing a line and then if there's another edition great will be another edition and um, the and the editors constantly holding that in their mind and moving back and forth between fixed and unfixed and at a certain point they're just saying right it's good enough so this is a kind of description of what the editor does which is a way of showing how imagination works, but with constraints. And I, I hope that there's some, you know, common points there for, for all of us. Certainly, thanks, Susan. 
It's a good thought. thoughts. And I've, def I've written down a couple of questions of my own off that. So we'll come to those a bit later, I think. Uh, but next we'll go to um, Professor Peter Yeager. Are you ready? Yes, I'm just gonna, just bear with me. I'm gonna share my screen here. And just a second, oops. I've somehow I've lost it here. Hold on. Share screen, share, and up, boing. Have you got that? Yep. All right. And then I'll just read your, your bio and then you'll be ready yeah. to go. That's fine. You can just leave this play now. It's silent. So you read, go ahead. Professor Peter Yeager was the first lecturer to be hired in our creative writing program way back in 2003. His research interests include ecological fiction and poetry, as well as the relationships between spirituality and writing in our 21st century context. He is the author of 12 books, including works of poetry, conceptual fiction, and hybrid creative critical research. He currently holds the position of Professor of Poetics at Rahampton. And he has two new books coming out, photographs of 10,000 questions from the Red Notebooks and For an Invisible Sangha. Take it away, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, performances. That, that's the kind of brief here. How many of us are familiar with this scenario? A person stands alone in front of an audience, holding a text and speaking in a slightly odd voice too regular to be conversation, too rough to be theater. Signs of listening in the audience are momentarily lost in occasional laughter some, and, or tense silences, or even sometimes whoops and cries of encouragement. Sometimes the reader uses a different, more public voice and refers to what is being read or to some other information of apparent interest in between the poems. This is the contemporary poetry reading, the performance of contemporary poetry. And this ritual form of reading is also preferred by the print poet, uh, who is primarily uh, you know, writing for the page as a kind of advertisement for poetry shared via the book tour or the book launch. So what I wanna think about is what might be some alternative ways to perform poetry? If writing itself can be an experiment, and we often think about innovative form and experimental form, what about the performance of it? How can we innovate in the actual performance of reading? Instead of the traditional literary reading described above, um, I think it's, it's quite interesting to think about performances that focus on passage of very, very long periods of time. These are known as durational performances or in literature, durational readings. And uh, just, just uh, as a side note here, there are precedents for this kind of thing in the visual arts. Um, some prominent examples include uh, Te Ching Hesse's time clock piece of 1981, where the artist punched a time clock. They used to have these clocks where you would put a card in. I'm going to turn this phone off. It's ringing away. I don't know. Ding, yeah, uh, speaking of time clocks, you put these cards in and they would tell what time you got to work. I don't think they have those anymore probably, but he punched a time clock every hour for 12 straight months, 24 hours a day. He'd wake up, punch it, go back to sleep. He was never, so he had to stay close. Or The House with Ocean View by Marina Abramovich, where she lived silently for 12 days without any food at all on stage in front of an audience that would come and go. And perhaps the most well-known durational reading pieces out of the art world into more reading um, would be John Cage's Empty Words, which was in four separate uh, sections of two and a half hours each. So it's a 10 hour reading. Um, I only know of him doing it, doing it in a, a, you know, a 2.5 hour section, but people have read the whole thing. Or American poet Ron Silliman for his performance of his book, Ket Jack, which lasted for four and a half hours. He, he stood on a street corner in San Francisco and uh, read it right through without intermission, the entire book. So the question arises, how can an audience respond or even listen to such a reading and what is the point of it, really? That's two questions. For one thing, the audience isn't expected to attend where it may be. They can come and go just as an audience would 
perhaps walking through an art gallery, might sit in front of a painting for three or four minutes and then go to the next painting, or they might linger for half an hour in front of a single painting. It depends on how compelling it is. Um, but in that short period of time, the audience gets kind of an experience from the work, whatever it may be, or it may be a video they passed by or anything like that. So I'm just gonna talk about um, some of my own performances here. And I'll just back this up because I'm going to let it play through again. Um, and I'm just going to talk about this book I wrote called Mid Amble in 2017. This is a 100,000 word long prose poem, um, which I read uh, uh, on various places. And this, the video you see in the background, um, this is a reading I gave that was situated out of doors um, on, at a location along one of the main medieval pilgrimage routes in the south of France at a literary festival that was held there in 2015. The reading of the text dialogue with sounds of the local natural environment with attendees at the festival who came from time to time and then left or with walkers and contemporary pilgrims as they passed by. The subject matter of my book was long distance walking uh, and the experience of pilgrimage. Now, listen, li listeners were offered the opportunity to hear the performance intermittently over a, a reading of several hours. And one point here is that the length of the reading was meant to form an analogy with the time taken to walk these long distance uh, footpaths. Walking these paths, you know, stretching sometimes hundreds or even thousands of miles can be grueling time consuming activities. So in a sense, this long reading embodied in a limited form uh, that kind of, or it mimicked in any, ca any case, that experience of uh, a, a performance that's in tune with its subject matter. So I think that's about all I have to say about that. I'm happy to talk about it uh, in our panel discussion. Marvelous, thank you very much for that, Peter. That's grand. And finally, Jeff Hilson, are you ready? I think you're on. There. I am on mute. I was on mute. Do you want to read? I have a PowerPoint to show, but I'm not, I, I, I want to bring it in a little way into my talk. So I don't want to start with it, but if you could, am I enabled to share? Wonderful. Yes, Thanks, Andy. Uh, and uh, I'll just read your bio and then you'll be on your way. Dr. Jeff Hilson has written five books of poetry, Stretchers, Bird Bird, In the Asarts, Latona Prost Variations, and Organ Music. He has also edited the Reality Street Book of Sonnets, which US po poet Ron Silliman described as the finest collection of contemporary sonnets ever put together. Um, and I, it is a very good book. I quite enjoy it. Um, <laughs> Please go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Andy. Um, okay, so uh, I want to think about uh, performance briefly in relation to two concrete poems. And I'll say a little bit more about concrete poetry in a sec, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Both of, both of which, both these poems give me pleasure, if not joy. One of them gives me joy, at least. You decide. Um, one of the poems is by the Bolivian Swiss poet Eugen Gomringer, uh, the other by the British poet Bob Cobbing. So concrete poetry, for those of you who might not know, is a branch or subset, if you like, of visual poetry. Visual poetry being what's known as an intermedia form. In other words, a kind of fusion of poetry and visual art. Concrete poetry is poetry that emphasizes the materiality of language. In other words, it draws attention to language as a medium. And it usually emphasizes uh, typographic arrangements on the page over and above the semantic content. It abandons the linearity of sentences and syntax. And Broadly, it's what might be called uh, denotative rather than connotative. And by that, a quote from Bob Cobbing might be useful. It's about making the poem more itself. Making the poem more itself. 
So um, if I can share, is that at all visible? Not yet. Okay, so I have to share, don't I? Okay. So we're now back on to Zoom 101. Is that visible? Yeah. Great. Okay. So here is Eugen Gomringer's poem, uh, Silencio, from 1953-1954, arguably the most famous concrete poem of all time. Um, a lot has been written about this poem. In fact, I was just reading this morning about uh, how it might be a sonnet. Um, discuss. Um, I see it as um, a kind of flag, uh, remembering that concrete poetry was an international phenomenon with practitioners all over the world, in Europe, in South America, uh, in the US uh, and the Far East. Uh, so Silencio, in a way, is the kind of international flag of concrete poetry. The point about the poem is that you get the idea immediately, which is the point, really, that you get it immediately. It's a big impact piece. Um, that empty space at the centre of the poem speaks for itself, or rather doesn't speak. Um, it kind of paradoxically speaks its uh, emptiness, if you like. And thinking back to uh, the terms of, uh, of this discussion today, um, it's what you might call a, a, an auto-performative piece. The poem performs its own, its own meaning. And there's a connection, I think, here to be made. I was talking to Peter about this slightly earlier, um, to, uh, to Cage's, John Cage's Four Minutes 33, which was composed around the same time in 19... 1952. So this kind of idea of silence was in the air, if you like. Um, you could, thinking about performance, you could read Silencio out loud. But I think that would be to return to the kind of linearity that Gomringer's poems are against. By the way, um, he called his own poems constellations rather than poems. You get the sense there of what kind of Gomringer thinks a poem is, constellations. So Silencio is a kind of constellation of words. Um, Gomringer's Silencio is a piece of what's called clean concrete poetry. And you'll understand what I mean by clean uh, when I show you the second poem I want to uh, 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 show, which is Bob Cobbing's uh, Wississippi from 1969. Okay, let me just click on. Oh, there's Gomringer. A, a very cute picture of him demonstrating his own poem, I think. Um, so there's Cobbing, um, both two old white men. I love that picture. Um, and this is the piece that I want to uh, just think about briefly. Um, Mississippi from 1969, um, sometimes also called uh, Whisper Piece. Um, this is a classic piece of what's become known as dirty concrete poetry. Um, the kind of concrete you'll find on any badly maintained brutalist social housing estate here in the UK. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, you can see immediately, I think, what makes it dirty. Um, the dense, overprinted text, uh, the words which you can just about make up out at the top of the page disintegrate and, and are scattered uh, across the page as you, as you descend down it. All of which, of course, make it very difficult to read. It's a challenge, uh, is it not, to any linear concept of, of reading, you know, that you start at the top uh, left-hand corner and you end up at the bottom right. All concrete poetry challenges that, that notion in one way or another. Um, it's also, of course, a deliberate affront to the simplicity and minimalism of, of a poem like Silencio, although Bob himself did do some poems in that kind of, in that kind of vein. Um, in terms of performance, Cobbing saw many of his texts as 
scores for vocalization. In other words, he saw them as the spr as, as kind of springboards for performance, either uh, individual or in uh, collaboration. And this piece uh, is no exception. Uh, so what I want to do just to end, I guess, is to play you a, uh, a recording, a performance or recording of uh, Wississippi slash Whisper piece um, that was performed with the um, musician and composer Ania Lockwood. So I will now attempt, I'll stop that share and just play you a little bit of Mississippi and pray that this works. Do I have to do anything, Andy, to, to make this happen, to share um, sound? You may still have to share your screen. Um, and then as you're sharing your screen, also share, there should be a box you have to tick. Okay, That's let's it. try this. Let's get rid of that. Okay, where are we? Um, oh, go to the, oh, sorry. There's something up here that should, I've got something up here which should enable me to share sound. Hmm. Uh, let's try this anyway. Let's see what happens. Can you hear this? No, no, I'm afraid not. Okay, that was inevitable, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> but if people do want to access it, it's on writing. It is on pen sounds. Uh, uh, there's Bob with his partner, um, uh, Jennifer Pike. And yes, if you scroll down, you can hear a recording of Mississippi. It's a shame I can't play it now because I'm uh, incompetent with Zoom. Why don't you just read it for us, Jeff? Yeah, okay, let's read it. It goes a bit like this. Mississippi. And it goes on like that for eight minutes gets a little bit more vigorous halfway through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for the, the performance. I can, I can definitely say the performance and the print both brought me joy. For sure. Um, and now that you've each given us a, a lot of uh, a lot of starting points to think on, um, we're going to come to the fun bit. Has any one of you got any um, points that you, you want to pick up and or ask questions of each other or discuss further. I mean, I'd like to say simply that I think the variety of things that we've all said and shared shows <laughs> what an exciting, interesting world we all live in as, as writers and the kind of, you know, from Susan's talk about absolutely thinking of, of you know, kind of an edition be a, being a snapshot of something to the other poets that we've been looking at. Cool, makes me just want to go and write or be silent. And that performance is perhaps also a kind of process rather than an end product. Um, I guess that's something that all of these, all of these pieces in one way or another um, have kind of embodied as well. Hmm. I mean, I suppose I'm curious uh, because I've, I mean, I, I've been less involved than the three of you uh, from poetry with sort of ongoing conversations about these ideas. I'm curious to know whether there was anything coming up in my talk, which was surprising in any way, or, um, you know, um, or particularly uh, in, uh, in either a good or bad way, or, or just, you know, something you want to explore. I really, 
Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. I really liked what you said about good enough. You know, um, good enough to send off. The, you could think about that as in some ways as, you know, perfection is an unreachable uh, object and and everything in a way is a process. And when you have good enough, you know, it's, it, it then allows you to get on to the next project and complete something. And that's quite useful. So I, I thought that was very good. Apparently there's a good enough manifesto out there. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Which has to do with, with making and publishing as well. Really? About it's, I can look it up for you. It's called the Good Enough Manifesto, I believe. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I, I really like the way that you, you actually used that. It was quite good. I, I thought I was the only person. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun, as they say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's also, it's about saying that we don't have to have perfect knowledge to know things or to, or to, you know, that, or that something being complete is not somehow a killing of it. It's, a, it's, or at least you have to have death in order to have life, basically. You know, you have to say this is finished in order to be able to go on to do, to create. Um, sorry, that's a bit um, uncollected. I don't know. Mm. The Russian poet Alexander Bloch said that you can never finish a work you can only ever abandon it. Oh, yes. Yes, that rings a bell. Yes. Although that's <laughs> some of those clean concrete poems, if you look at those, they're about as near to kind of a, a notion of perfection as you could get in a way. There's very little that's kind of contingent about them uh, on, on one level, I think, very differently to some of the kind of dirty poems, if you kind of go down that route, which are very much kind of more obviously kind of works in, in progress and have a kind of sense of, incompletion to them i think that's an interesting com contrast i think between those two ways of thinking about what a concrete poetry what a concrete poem can be i mean silencio in a way is about as perfect uh, a, a piece as you can possibly get in many ways i think as a complete kind of object um or, or as a kind of notionally slightly incomplete object but um, um but cobbing's work is definitely has that sense of uh, yeah ab abandonment. Although having said that, all those pieces which look like a mess, you know, those dirty concrete pieces which look like uh, take hours and hours to complete. Um, so it's a kind of interesting, again, possible paradox there. Well, Peter, by the way, I I just quickly put in the phrase "good enough" and then publishing into a search, and it's all come up with stuff about. Is your book good enough for publication? <laughs> I'll look it up for you because that might not be the exact title, but that's definitely uh, a big part of it. I'll, I'll find it for you and send it on. Sure, sure. And then no, I, can I mean, that's it to you, Andy, if you want to go further with yeah. that. I was I a bit like... curious about this um, notion that uh, several artists were thinking of the of silence, you know, and after the war, it's a big theme, and um, that you mentioned, Jeff and Gomringer and Cage, and there are other, there's paintings. There's, I think there's a, there must be several abstract expressionist paintings with the word, you know, door into silence or mm -hmm. something like that. You know, the, uh, the, the poet Steve McCaffrey interpreted Gomringer's Silencio as a, as a war poem mm. in that it was meant to be the, the word silence all around were, were like the, the walls of a, of, a, of a prison camp. And there was a, in the, in the center, there's, there's a literal embodiment of silence, which would have been the prisoners kept within the concentration camp or the death camp or whatever. That's, I mean, this is a kind of a far reaching step, but I, 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 to my mind, I think some of this notion of silence comes out of deeply traumatic experiences uh -huh. about the war. And it's interesting that that then became such a theme at that time, so so prevalent, you know. It's very different, the orientation of it in Cage, but it's, it is related in a sense. What is Cage's, um, can you say a little bit about Cage's? Well, there's various, there's various takes on it. And the one that I tried to put forward was that it was similar to a Buddhist meditation in the sense that in a meditation, say it's 20 minutes long, you have a gong, and you're totally silent for 20 minutes, just observing what's going on. And then there's a gong and then you're, you're free to 
not observe anymore because it's too hard to keep observing after 20 minutes for most people. So that, so that four minutes and 33 seconds was the start of the pieces. When you open the piano, that's like the gong. Then you got four minutes of 33 seconds of intense listening. So, the, so this is because Cage was bringing noise as part of sound, the kind of sound that would be interesting. So you'd listen to the birds or whatever, the creaking of the floor, the wind, coughing for that time intensely and then close the piano after the stopwatch, David Tudor on the stopwatch, 433, click, close the piano, and then the meditation is over. So I, th I saw it as that, that, that in, in my cage work. And I, I think there's a good argument to be made for that, given everything else that he was interested in about Buddhism at the time. There was an attempt, wasn't there, some years ago to make four minutes, 33 seconds, uh, uh, a, a, a chart, a top of the chart, <laughs> to, to counter to counter the kind of um, all that stuff on Britain's Got Talent or whatever that terrible show was with um, Simon Cowell and uh, and the rest of it. what was that called? X what a great idea. The X Factor. That's right. There was an attempt to make Cage's Four Minutes Thirty Three a hit, and the thought of that being played on the radio for Four Minutes and Thirty Three, <laughs> I think, would have been totally great. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Four Minutes Thirty Three of Dead Air. There's a Hungarian uh, sound artist who recorded, you know, on, on the old vinyl records, you'd have a song and then you'd have, a, you know, two or three or more seconds of silence between and then the next song. And you could actually look at the vinyl and see where the songs, each song was. And he recorded, I forget his name, he recorded all those silent bits in all of John Cage's records and made one big long Cage record of the, of the bits between the songs. <laughs> So that's another kind of performance, I suppose. Um, I mean, just just to um, move from the silence to the embodiment, um, I, I just remembered a, a, a story I would tell. Um, I when I years ago when I was working in print production, uh, and the, at the time the the um, software state of art software for page makeup was called Quark. And um, it had, if you wanted to move, I think you still get this. If you wanted to move the page on the screen, you, you do a certain step and then you get a hand, uh, you sort of move. And I, during production, it was very intense. And I actually had a dream one night that I was the hand. <laughs> 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 how great moving the page around. <laughs> it was great. very very um strong feeling when i woke up i was completely confused so anyway <laughs> hey, peter can you say something about the about the um the, the the position of the text, the print in in your in your in that in that reading in that durational in that durational reading that you gave in in the south of France. I mean, how does because we think about print and performance? How does the well that that version of it was simply because the book hadn't been published yet, so it was an A4 size print off of of the manuscript um, with very big font, so I didn't have to squint. And, um, and so I just had that, that just, it was just like prose. It was just like reading prose. There was no, there's no, whereas sometimes in notated poetry, you know, line breaks and whatnot and spaces between pages all indicate again, silence on the page and, and different times and small pauses. And you get this kind of kinetic push and pull um, because of that. But, but my piece was just written as prose and it had enough internal rhythm as a prose poem because of the kind of, fairly rigorous grammatical constraints that were on it so that it, it read with a rhythm to it. Um, one, one thing I found really interesting about those durational readings, I've done several of them, is, you know, sometimes you look up and there's like 30 people there. And then another time you look up and you're the only person there and you're reading to the air. And that's a whole other experience, a way to experience your own work, you know, because not knowing what kind of audience, it's, about, it's a question of audience not knowing who the audience is, how many there are. It's a bit like publishing. You publish a book, you don't know who's gonna read it. And now you can actually look up and see, oh, here's a, 
And it's not because one section is necessarily better than another. It's just that people chance to drift in at that point and then drift out. You mentioned um, Ron Silliman's review of your um, Reality Street book of the sonnet, of sonnets. Sona? Of the sauna. Sonnets. <clears throat> Plural. Plural sonnets. Um, I was doing one of these dur dur durational readings at, the at something called the Bury Text Festival up in Manchester. And um, this was a three or, three or four hour reading in a, in a room that was like a room full of books in a big museum in, in, in Bury. And Ron Silliman was also reading on the festival. And at times I'd look up and the room would be full. People would be on the floor and standing against the wall and sitting on chairs. And other times I would go for no, you know, I'd just be reading a, totally to an empty room. I just keep reading the same pace, no change at all. It's part of the, adhering to the concept. At one point, Ron Silliman came in and sat down and, and I read to Ron Silliman for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, just me, just me reading to Ron, no one else around. And I, I felt it was so strange because of course, Ron Silliman is a big kind of influence, a hero on me, he's a pioneer of this kind of work. And here I am, I'm reading and I'm going, my goodness, Ron Silliman is listening to me read this stuff. <laughs> It was quite interesting. And then after we went for lunch and he told me his thoughts on it and, uh, you know, it was a very encouraging, so. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting for me is what's happening at the moment in this meeting in as much as the whole kind of business of the transcription device. And, you know, I mean, you all know that I enjoy things going wrong. Um, and so when we're kind of talking, and something gets mistranslated and appears on the screen, surprising or wrong. They think mistra they go mistranslated. Um, that's really interesting. And I've got a project at the moment where I'm, um, I use my phone, I've got a translation device on it. And so I hold the phone over a piece, usually Chinese or Japanese um, poem. And, the, and, and then you can press record on your phone. So it records the actual thing that's, that's taking place. And when the Translate app operates, it, it, and you move it slightly, it will flicker and it will give you alternate readings of all of these texts. And so that kind of business of, I mean, in a way, back to our kind of ideas of provisionality and, you know, kind of a work being abandoned. And, and for me, I, I kind of, I'm really interested in what, in how we don't have control over our work in lots of ways. Like you're saying, Peter, you look up, you don't know who's there. The book goes out and the world, you don't know who's reading it. The idea that there is some kind, in the old days, I can't remember what it was called back when the internet was just starting up via voice. Maybe you'll remember um, what it was called. One of the earliest transcription apps. Um, it was clearly the algorithm for it was to do with people who were having business conversations. So, you, you know, you could, you would be reading in a poem or a piece and it would be turning, it would turn, you know, everything would become, kind of the closest corporate noun and verb that you could come up with. And uh, yeah, one of my books, I, I did a whole kind of transcription of one of my books, which was all about sparrows and the English countryside. And it suddenly became about takeovers and, you know, spreadsheets and God knows what. And so, yeah, what's happening today seems like a really interesting future possibility for live readings and the way it kind of works. It's amazing, that's a, that's a great example. It's amazing that some of the things that these apps can do, you know, um, you, you, one of your favorite poets and poet I also really like is Bill Bissett, who his language, if you've ever read Bill Bissett, he doesn't spell anything in a kind of standardized way. It sounds more like, it, 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 it's all spelt the way it sounds. So just for example, the word blue would be B-L-E-W. And the whole thing is like this. There's a poet named Darren Wurschler who had a, 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 an app that he ran Bill Bissett poems through to get the correct English <laughs> spelling. 
<laughs> and it turned out to be to radically different poems than what Dil Bill wrote, you know. And uh, I think there's something, this is going to be happening more and more. I think this is a thing, you know, you don't need a weather app to know which way the wind blows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the way forward, you know, I think. This is actually doing a very good job, though, this, um, it, although something you said, Tim, earlier was translated, because it's a form of translation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, as Mr. Baker, and I don't think you mentioned Mr. Baker at any point. I used to have a chemistry teacher called Mr. Baker, um, who was exasperated mainly by all my chemistry experiments, which also went wrong. Um, <laughs> but but the, the, the kind of missed the idea of mistranslation as a kind of performance. And you often get that on uh, subtitles as well, don't you, on TV in the in precisely these kinds of uh, situations. Uh, oh, I was waiting for it to do something there. And it didn't. There's an example also of someone who I, I certainly, I think Peter and Jeff, you may well know the answer to this. Someone did a whole poetry recital and they learned how to say the whole thing backwards. Does this ring a bell? And they recorded it and played it the other way around so that it came out forwards. Oh. But, oh, I can't. Yeah, I can't remember where that, that was. Like that scene from Twin Peaks in the in the Black Lodge, which was recorded that way. But um, ah, okay, very okay. interesting. There was also a poet. I think I might have gone to this this reading with you, Tim, way back at the turn of the century, <laughs> um, <laughs> which was I think it was was it Aaron Williamson, who was a, a deaf poet. And he had voice recognition software, but he didn't really speak in any kind of intelligible way because he had never heard language in his life. So he would speak into this and then it would put the words of his, what sounded like mumbling, change it into English words, which would not really be, be the actual on a big screen behind him while he was reading. And that was the poem. And it was totally kind of a chance operated thing because the, it was just, based on what this software could or couldn't perform. I thought it was a fascinating. Yeah, idea. yeah. Yeah, this is far too good, this software. Mm. But are you saying that when it, when, it, when it stops, it bungles it all up? So it's better in a live situation, but when you, I mean, will, will, will this actually appear in the, in, in the final transcript? Laura, no. is that what you were saying? This will end up in almost like a separate document, almost like a text document um, and it will all be in there um, but not actually onto the video right so what okay. I do is I use the auto live transcription feature on Premiere Pro to then put it onto the actual video so then it's all inclusive for everybody to watch so what the listeners on YouTube will actually receive is a second edition yeah of this. <laughs> there really. get second edition and uh, I recommend we've got five minutes of three so I'm just going to close with uh, one final question to all of you. Um, we should take as long as it takes to answer. We'll see. Um, but I just wanted to ask, in terms of creating pieces for performance or print or performance and print, do you see a tendency in writers, new to the craft or not, to consider a piece as meant for print or meant for performance, thus ignoring the other? Is there a tendency for that? I think a lot of people write for performance. Slam poetry is an example, right? That, that thank God, is a reasonably useful, powerful thing now. It's not just sloganeering. Um, so the quality of slam poetry now is much more literary, if you will. Um, it's much more sophisticated. But I think it's about audience in a way, isn't it? And you do get different audiences. Um, and so you write towards different audiences. Okay, look, that's my one minute's worth of answer. I think, I think uh, you know, there are so many variations that people do. Everybody's got their own approach. Some are re writing just for performance. Some are writing for the page, but, it's, but they want to know that it's performance. My last 10 seconds, I know a writer in Canada who writes a poem for the page. During his readings, anything he doesn't feel like he can actually read in good conscience. That's how he edits his poems. He knows then he goes home and he scratches those things out. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, 
punctuation is like a musical score. And we, you know, we talk about voice uh, and tone and so on on the page. So it's, um, yeah, and we, we, we were always telling people in class, you know, if you're not sure what to do with your read it out loud. So they're all connected. Mm. Yeah, poets, poets who, I mean, you know, Larkin, Philip Larkin, bless him, was the famous poet who never really wanted to read his own poems out loud. And, and thank goodness he didn't do so more often. Um, <laughs> but um, but th there are poets who write for the page who should actually, once that you hear them read out their own work, should just keep their poems to the page. Should just keep their homes to the page, it says. <laughs> Hey, if you could make a make a home off just printing poetry, that would be pretty good. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> Maybe one day. Uh, and with that, I think we'll come to, come to an end of this uh, this panel. Thank you all for being here and discussing. It was very interesting, and I hope everyone <laughs> who watches this back finds it just as interesting as I did. Thank you very much for Thanks, Andy. Thanks, it Andy. Up, Andy. That's great. Yeah, Thank you. No, very enjoyable. Thank you for organizing. And Laura, thanks for your work on this too. Yeah, thanks very much to Laura. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You. Okay. okay, but